Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Starman channel. I hope everyone's safe and well. Today we're going to be taking a break from the weather. There's a, a lot of people on YouTube at the moment covering the weather. However, I've seen the distance for the UK and Europe. Another short, sharp burst of Siberian easterlies that we'll be looking at later on in the week, possibly towards the, the weekend. However, this video is going to be about our solar cycle, our progression, our magnetosphere, our magnetic fields weakening. We'll also be looking back um, through a historical graphs and looking at solar storms versus sunspot activity. And I hope you enjoy today's tutorial YouTube video so we'll move on and have a look for those of you who watch these videos I'm quite sure you're all aware of what happens to the magnetosphere when we have a solar flare or a CME of a significant class and it contorts our magnetosphere so we'll go on and have a look at such an event that happened in 2005 and then we'll go on and explain a little more detail how these things come to fruition as um, solar energetic particles and ground level enhancements of solar energetic particles go through our atmosphere through the Van Allen radiation belt and then the monitors pick them up at ground level. So we'll go on and have a look at that first. So here we can see this is the day side and this is the night side and we can see these solar streams coming in hitting the bow shock and indeed going round the magnetosphere to the reconnection tail and coming back in towards the Van Allen radiation belt here we can see significant solar pulses coming through there hitting the magnetosphere orange being the most significant down to green and blue been lower so energetic particles as you can see this event in 2005 was quite significant and we'll go down and have a read about what it says this particular CME occurred on the 20th of January 2005 and was later shown to be one of the fastest CMEs during solar cycle 23 as a result it took only 34 hours for the cloud of plasma to cross the 150 million kilometres gulf between the Sun and Earth, compared with a typical time of 3 to 4 days. Now you can hear people talking about solar energetic particle storms or plasma wind coming from the Sun, and they're saying, well, it really takes about 3 to 4 days to hit our magnetosphere and cause it a significant disruption. Well, when we get an X-class flare, once the CME takes off from the sun, we've already got slow solar wind particles flowing. Now, the forward shock of the of the of the CME that erupted enhances the speed of that slow solar wind, so that can take the time down to 34 hours, and even less depending on the velocity. So we go on now and have a look at what we're talking about. So if we look at this little graph here we can see the solar winds coming in and hitting the bow shock. It then travels into the magneto sheath, the cusps, and travels round to the reconnection point in the tail. It then get in that again sped through the magneto field lines into the radiation belt and this puffs up and every time, as we've just seen, we get one of these shocks, this releases the solar energetic particles from the radiation belt and it's picked up by monitors on the ground in Antarctica, which is either Dome B, Dome C, or in fact the Ulu Cosmic Radiation Monitor. So this is my personal graph that I've put together. Here we have a KP index which is in the top left hand corner and here we have the GOX x-ray flux with the two 
X-Class flares that happened on the 8th, uh, the 6th of the 9th, 2017th. As you can see, this purple bar represents the two flares. Now indeed, those X-Class flares were that significant. It only took 34 hours to travel the distance from the sun through the magnetosphere and it registered KP5 and KP6 from midnight on the 7th until midnight on the 8th of September. So if we look at this graph along the bottom here, this is what the data monitor base picks up at ground level enhancement. And as you can see it started around about 12 o'clock on the 10th of September. And here we can see I've columned it in blue with a most significant enhancement of 16.35% which happened on Sunday September the 10th at 1800 hours and then it gradually petered off until again 1200 on the 11th of September where it was only re registering 7.5% increase. So if we go back to looking at our first solar wind video that we just looked at and it said an X-Class flare can take 34 hours rather than 3 to 4 days well indeed this is a prime example of what happened in September 2017 from the time the X-Class flare kicked off it took 34 hours to reach our magnetosphere which caused significant disruptions and it caused between KP5 and KP6 indexes in a magnetospheric disruption. It then took another 36 hours to travel around the magnetosphere through the Van Allen radiation belt before indeed it was picked up by the DOMB neutron monitor count in Antarctica. So solar energy particles or SEPs as we like to call them are high energetic particles coming from the Sun. They were first observed in the early 1940s and they consist of protons, electrons and HZE ions with energies ranging from a few tens of keV to GeV or giga electron volts and the fastest particles can reach 80% of the speed of light. So you can imagine ladies and gentlemen if they're reaching 80% of the speed of light we can understand why it's only taking 72 hours before it's picked up at ground level enhancement. So I just thought I'd show you that little graph there ladies and gentlemen. So we'll now move on and look at our solar field strength since 1976 which is north and south from cycle 21 to currently which I've marked off as the 2nd of the 3rd 2018. And indeed you can see from cycle 21 the polar field strength has gradually been getting less and less in the northern and in the southern hemisphere and we only are currently at uh, minus 75 to plus 56 to 57. And there's no significant sign of solar cycle 25 at this point. As we can see, solar minimum of cycle 21, solar minimum of cycle 22, and solar minimum of cycle 23. Well, if we look at the observations again, we can see that this solar polar field, north and south, has got to come back a quite significant distance before we, th before we start seeing a crossover, as we have done in the past. So our solar polar field strength is indeed weakening and if this trend line carries on we should be round about here somewhere on both of the solar polar fields north and south. Now as a, re a result of that weak solar polar field again if we look at solar wind speed and solar wind density from Omni 2 at one astronomical unit which indeed is the distance Earth is from the Sun. If we look at solar cycle 22, 
we had a peak there of 650 kilometers a second wind speed and then we go down to cycle 23 and we only hit a peak of 600 kilometers a second then we go down to cycle 24 and our maximum peak was 525 kilometers a second and this is on a monthly average ladies and gentlemen before you start shouting at me oh we've seen 600 with 600 these are an average ladies and gentlemen so as you can see our solar wind speed on an average is in, indeed on the decline if we go across the right hand side of the graph and look at solar wind density which is adjusted to one astronomical unit and again from Omni 2 we can see in solar cycle 22 that we had an average of 14 kilometers squared centimeter squared sorry and in solar cycle 23 it dropped down to 10.5 centimeters squared we are now in solar cycle 24 and our average wind density is dropped right down on an average to 9.2 centimeters squared so in line with the solar polar field strength both solar wind speed and solar wind density has took a massive drop I've had a colleague on Twitter talking about the Ulysses well this is a prime example of that and indeed it's just an enhancement of what the Ulysses spacecraft solar probe indeed told us back in the 1990s again if we look at this graph in blue here is the number of storms per year which is solar storms reading the magnetosphere and across the top here is our solar cycle progression and we are currently at this point in 2018 which is on average of 60 to 72 solar flux trend line as we can see from all of the solar cycles this is the most common denominator and this is the most common number that we see of solar flux unit during any solar cycle in history and we are currently at 68 solar flux units but if we look at the progression here ladies and gentlemen from 1965 from March actually 1965 and we progressed it through <coughs> excuse me to indeed the late 1998 we can see from this point that the solar wind and solar storms have quite significantly took a decline and indeed this is in line with our solar cycle progression as we can see solar cycle 12 13 and 14 were very very weak and we had very few solar storms however as we go up the scale and indeed looking at solar cycle 19 we had some significant solar storms solar cycle 21 also and it starts to die off after that point however mid cycle 23 we did have a surge of some solar storms during that period What's more significant on this graph, ladies and gentlemen, is if you do look at the solar storms, 82% of all these solar storms happen after solar maximum. So we should be seeing a lot more solar storms coming from the sun is in our magnetosphere through coronal hole activity. But as we can see here, we are not solar cycle 23 after solar cycle maximum we've seen a number of solar storms solar cycle 22 the same but we never ever see any on the incline to solar maximum as substantial as we do in the declining phase of the solar cycle so this is a good graph to carry on ladies and gentlemen we'll see it up to nine up to 2024 to see indeed where we're going with solar cycle 25 and indeed if we see any significant ramp up of solar storms which unfortunately I feel we're not going to see.
What I'd also like to point out to you is cosmic ray fall and temperature increase. And this is land temperature, ladies and gentlemen. As we can see, peaks and cosmic rays are in the red. We can see a drop off in temperatures. However, if we look at the X-ray flux increase, we see a cosmic ray decrease and vice versa. So low solar activity results in more particle nucleation and propagation of clouds. As we can see, when the neutrons drop off or cosmic rays, whichever way you want to call it, we have a temperature increase, which is similar to the solar cycle pattern. Again, we see it drop off the cosmic radiation and we see a sharp increase in land temperatures. So if we just take a brief excerpt from this graph and then we go and have a look at Dr. Roy Spencer's graph that he puts together on a monthly basis based on lower tropospheric temperatures and we look at 1998 where we see a drop off in cosmic radiation we should see on his graph a sharp increase in land temperatures so we'll go over and have a look and indeed it's well correlated as we can see from Dr Roy Spencer's graph here we have a sharp increase in temperatures and then again a drop off to 2000 to 2001 as we can see we had a sharp increase again in cosmic radiation So this graph was formulated from Smensmark in a reply to Lockwood and Frolic. And indeed it does correlate very, very well with Dr. Roy Spencer's hypothesis and his planning. Proposing CO2 is not, that is not, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why we see fluctuations in land temperatures. It's all part of of a bigger picture as we can see from our sun indices from cosmic ray indices and indeed from land sea surface temperatures so again we'll look at another graph that I formulated which is a list of solar flares since 1998 and it's listed on this graph all categories from C to S class flares. And as we can see in solar maximum, we had 28. However, in solar maximum 2014, we saw 27. 2008 and 2009, indeed, we had zero solar flares. So again, as you can see, from 2014 to 2018, we have indeed had more solar flares than what we, did, what we did have in solar cycle 23. However, these solar flares were much more insignificant. However, the indexes do suggest that we have had more solar flares, but did not ignite any significant magnetospheric disruption throughout solar cycle 24 apart from those X-class flares we've seen early in September 2017 as we just saw on the graph so again if we look at some more of my graphs if we look at the lower troposphere temperature in the northern hemisphere for the last 14 months we can see we had a spike at the end Sorry, in the middle of October of 0 0.66 degrees C. However, in February 18, it's dropped down to 0 0.24 degrees Celsius. On the right-hand side, if we lower troposphere temperature in the southern hemisphere for the last 14 months, we can see we only had a peak of 0 0.59 degree, degrees Celsius. However, that has plummeted in January and February, suggesting summer in the southern hemisphere 
has been a very, very weak affair. Is this an indice for a very bad winter in the Southern Hemisphere? I believe it is, yes. However, I will follow this trend very closely. Again, if we look at the lower troposphere temps for the tropics, again over the last 14 months, we can see we had a peak of 0.54 degrees Celsius. However, in January and February again, this has dropped off significantly. And indeed, in January of this year, it was in the minus 0.12 degrees Celsius, with a small climb to plus 0.03. Again, suggesting that we have cooling in the tropics and the southern hemisphere. So if we take a look at our F10.7 cm radio flux indices for March 2018, we can see we're well, well below the mean line of 68 to 72, and even on the first we drop down to 66 solar flux units, and indeed I've not plotted on the graph yet, but we are still at the average of 68 solar flux units. Very, very weak indeed. Now here's a very interesting graph, ladies and gentlemen, that you wouldn't see nowhere. If you Google it, you won't find it, because I made it. And I like to call it my solar system wheel. Here we have the Sun, which is in the centre, and here we have Earth's revolution around the Sun at any given month. The light blue here is how, <coughs> excuse me, the Sun has changed its orbit in the solar system over the last 5,000 years, and the position of Earth in orbits around the Sun. I'd also like to point out that I've put on here all of the solar cycle maximums since solar cycle 1. The strongest being the pink squares and the weakest being the green squares. And it's obvious to see that in the month of July we have had never had a solar cycle maximum. And we have never had a solar cycle maximum in the month of October. If we look at where all our solar maximums occur, we can see we have had two in February, two in March, two in May, and we have had one in November, and one in December, and one in August. So if we're taking a percentage here, ladies and gentlemen, and look at February, we have had 20.83% of all solar cycle maximums happen in February. 8.33% have happened in March. We have never had a solar cycle maximum in April. And we have had two in May. What's more notable to me is the Carrington event which happened in, on the 1st of September 1859 when Earth was at this location in conjunction with the Sun and how funny was it in 2017 we had two massive X-class flares again in the same location in the solar system in respect to its adjudicate with the Sun which was in September. So if we look at this box on the left hand side and we can see in pink which is saying our strongest solar cycles in history Solar Cycle 3 was in May 1778, Solar Cycle 4 1788, Solar Cycle 8 1837, Solar Cycle 19 was in 1958, Solar Cycle 22 in 1989, Solar Cycle 9 maximums in February of 1848, and Solar Cycle 11 in August of 1870. Solar Cycle 18 was in May of 1947. And we had a rogue cycle in cycle cycle 21, which was in December. However, if we look at from 60 degrees round to 180 degrees, we have only ever had two 
strong solar cycle maximums with the majority being from 210 degrees to 330 degrees as we're looking at it in our revolution around the Sun. It's also notable to see that our weakest solar cycles in history all happened again when the Earth was in this relative position to the Sun. Will solar cycle 24 be in the same situation and solar cycle 25? We will have to see. However, very unlikely that we're going to see a solar cycle maximum for cycle 25 in October, September, July or June as we have never ever in history had a strong solar cycle maximum in those months. And it's very unlikely that we're going to see a solar minimum in July, October, September or August. So I'll leave you today ladies and gentlemen with our real time forecast of solar energetic proton events. As you can see as of now at 22.55 our threshold is very flat and there are no proton flux events forecast and again if we look down to our x-ray flux and our magnetic connectivity estimation again we are basically at a flat line so it's highly unlikely we're going to see any solar energetic particle events at ground level enhancement Thanks for watching today. I hope you've got something out of the video. As I said, being as we've got another little Siberian easterly coming our way in another 7 to 10 days, I'll probably do a weather report on that. Northeast, brace yourself in the USA for yet some more low pressure systems. It's going to bring some substantial difficulty to you guys. I know I say 2050 you like uh, seeing snow, well you may be getting some off the next system so stay tuned, be prepared and as always stay safe, that's the Starman out.